With the advancements in science and technology, researchers are able to push the boundaries of tissue engineering and develop novel techniques that can be implemented for a variety of treatments. When considering basic 3D printing technology, doctors have been able to provide patients with specialized care specific to their particular case. Multiple handheld 3D printing devices are being manufactured to print gel layers developed with stem cells for their usages in orthopedics, ophthalmology, and trauma therapy. Scientists are also using decellularization techniques with different plants to provide requisite structure for engineering plant-based scaffolding needed for human tissue replacement. The future of tissue engineering is very bright as we have only scratched the surface of its potential, but in regards to stem cell clinical research, progression is being made with over 5,000 ongoing registered trials. Many of these are still in the recruitment phase and few are, have been completed. But today, I'll be explaining to you the results from a study conducted in 2015 by Kegler et al. that investigated the use of autologous cell enriched with CD90 mesenchymal stem cells, CD14 monocytes, and macrophages in patients with bone deficiencies of the maxillar sinus bone. This occurs due to the alveolar bone of the jaw not receiving enough, enough functional stimulus produced by the teeth. This evidently results in further bone resorption with severe horizontal and vertical bone deficiencies. Patients are left with inadequate bone volume to restore these areas of the jaw with functional or aesthetic tooth replacements. In order to restore function and aesthetics to the affected regions of the oral cavity, major alveolar bone reconstruction followed by dental prosthetic implants are required. Stem cell therapy has the potential to improve treatments for these patients that require bone engineering of localized craniofacial osseous deficiencies. This phase 1-2 clinical trial was designed to evaluate the reconstruction of bone deficiencies of the maxillar sinus with the transplantation of aut autologous cell enriched with CD90 stem cells and CD14 monocytes. Out of 30 patients enrolled, 4 withdrew from the study and 2 more dropped out before study completion. Bone height deficiencies ranged from 40-80% to 80 in all patients. Surgical parameters of the two treatments were equivalent between the groups and participants were randomized to receive either stem cells based onto beta tricalcium phosphate scaffolds or receive only that scaffold. The primary outcome variables were bone mineral density and bone volume fraction, with secondary outcome variables that included increase in linear radiographic bone height, increase in sinus bone volume, and bone volume slash initial graft volume ratio. Researchers stated throughout the study there were no serious study-related adverse events that were reported in examination of comprehensive assessments during the trial. There was one graft failure in the treatment group and one implant failure in the control group. For participants who were receiving stem cell therapy 12 to 14 days before initial surgical treatment, 50 to 70 cc's of bone marrow were aspirated from the posterior iliac crest. The collected marrow was transferred to a sterile blood bag and bone marrow mononuclear cells were purified by a phycal density gradient centrifusion and inoculated into a bioreactor. The system incorporates a single pass perfusion with a culture medium that consists of IMDM, 10% fetal bovine serum, 10% horse serum, and 5 micromoles of hydrocortisone. After cultivation for 12 days, the product is harvested by trypsinization, washed in a physiological buffer, and then collected in a sterile bag, where it is stored until the time of transplantation. The final cell composition is composed of a mixture of bone marrow derivative cells that includes different concentration of expanded CD90 mesenchymal stem cells and CD14 macrophages, and mononuclear cells from the original bone marrow aspirate. 12 to 14 days after the bone marrow aspiration, sinus elevation procedures were performed with simultaneous bone grafting. A full thickness, crestal incision, and flap was made in the vertical extensions in the lateral aspect of the maxilla is exposed. A window ostomy is prepared on the lateral aspect of the maxilla to access the maxillary sinus cavity. The Schneiderian membrane of the sinus is then gently reflected from the floor of the sinus cavity and elevated 1 to 2 centimeters. The sinus cavity was then grafted onto the elevated membrane by placing the bone void material beta TCP alone or the beta TCP loaded with stem cells. After the placement of the graft, the sinus access window opening was then covered with a bioresorbable occlusive collagen membrane and the flap was sutured to attain primary closure. Re-entry procedures of the grafted sites were then performed four, min four months after the sinus floor augmentation. Bone biopsy cores were removed with the drill from the area where the implants were going to be placed in the regions of the previous sinus graft. After the biopsies, oral implants ranging from 10 to 12 millimeters were then placed in the grafted sites. Sinus augmentation procedures and implant installations were performed by two different surgeons, but the bone core biopsy procedures were performed by one surgeon. Clinical, radiographic, and histologic analysis were performed after four months of treatments to evaluate the de novo engineered bone, and at the same time, oral implants were installed in the engineered bone, showing function was restored with dental tooth prosthetics.
All patients treated in the study were in need of bone regenerative procedures for oral implants and the clinical procedures were no different between the treatment groups. Favorable function and aesthetics were achieved in final tooth restorations in both groups. One of the patients in the cell therapy group indicated that the marrow harvesting procedures resulted in significant discomfort, and one patient in the control group indicated that he or she would not have followed up with the procedure if not necessary. When looking at the data collected in Figure 2, clinical images of the occlusal view in the initial indentulous region of the patients treated in the control and stem cell therapy group are shown in letters A and I. Lateral views of the surgical site located above the indentulous region are shown in letters B and J. This shows the preparation of the lateral aspect of the maxilla for access to the, to the schnadirian membrane in the maxillary sinus cavity. After elevation of the maxillary sinus, the beta TCP scaffold and stem cells on the scaffold are placed on the sinus cavity, seen in letters C and K. After the closure of the surgical site, occlusal views of the toothless areas two weeks after are shown healing in letters D and L. Four months after the control and stem cell treatment, oral implants are placed in the dentulous areas of the grafted regions, shown in letters E and M, and they're allowed to integrate into the bone for six months, shown in letters F and N. At six months, implants in both treatment groups are biomechanically loaded with functional dental prosthetics, restoring the indentulous areas of the teeth, shown in the occlusal views of G and O and the lateral views of H and P. Radiographic bone height is a key clinical determinant to assess the need of bone graphing in the areas of the posterior maxilla in proximity to the maxillary sinuses. In figure three, we can note that the significant changes in bone height were achieved in the control and stem cell therapy groups. Although alveolar bone height was increased up to fivefold in two of the cases in the stem cell group, there was no difference in the mean linear radiographic bone height changes between the treatment groups. Figure 4a describes the utilized autologous cell populations relative to the initial bone marrow aspirate, showing enriched 100-fold CD90 cells and CD14 cells during the cell expansion process. Looking at figure 4b, intact bone cores could, be could not be harvested from three patients, but analysis of imaging determined the extent of which regenerative tissues are composed of residual beta TCP graft particles and regenerative bone tissue. Figure 4c evaluates all the bone cores received, illustrating that a significant negative correlation between the amount of graft placed and the proportion of bone formed BVF within the regenerative tissue. So depending on the size of the defect, as the amount of scaffold material increased, the quality of regenerative bone tissue decreased. CBCT images were used to evaluate 3D changes in the bone volume within the treated area of the sinus cavity. Figure 5a shows that there is a significant increase in the bone volume in both treatment groups, but no difference between the groups of the ratio regenerative bone volume to initial grafted volume was observed. It appeared that the BVF of the regenerative bone was higher in the biopsies for patients who received the stem cell therapy. Table 2 shows that the BVF for biopsies from the stem cell therapy group were higher than the control group. Additionally, Figure 5c shows the bone quality for regenerated bone was significantly enhanced in patients that received the stem cell therapy. In conclusion, this randomized controlled trial was the first to evaluate stem cell therapy for craniofacial bone regeneration in severely atrophic maxia. These results provide evidence that cell-based therapies using enriched CD90 stem cell populations are safe for maxillar sinus floor reconstruction, offering the potential to accelerate and enhance tissue-engineered bone quality and other craniofacial bone efficiencies. A key finding from this study was that better quality bone was formed in patients who received the stem cell therapy, and bone quality significantly correlated with the percentage of autologous CD90 cells that were transplanted. This research can provide very important information for the future of stem cell therapies. Like most studies applying novel therapies, this clinical trial was designed to evaluate the safety and efficacy of using cell populations enriched with mesenchymal CD90 cells. This study is one of the first reports to evaluate how cell phenotypes correlate with the clinical regenerative outcomes and provides evidence that stem cell therapies could be considered treatments in other challenging oral and craniofacial bone defects. Moving forward in stem cell development, scientists are researching ways to make treatments more advanced and less invasive. Using less invasive techniques can lead to a decreased chance of infection and faster recovery. Advanced techniques have been developed with instruments that are special and make surgery easier. Also, I believe placing antibiotics into the scaffold can reduce the chance of infection and aid in recovery. Along with this, you could implement technology to control the stem cell's activity and regulate gene activity specific for that patient. In this scenario where patients are developing too much bone, they can stop taking the drug to prevent further growth. Lastly, I believe using a handheld 3D printing device to place the scaffolding can increase bone regeneration and speed up the recovery process. Thank you for watching my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.